Okay, um, thanks everyone for coming to our workshop. Um, so my name is James, I'm a clinical research associate um, from Vancouver General Hospital uh, in Vancouver from Canada. Um, so I'm just gonna kick us off by doing some introductions. So we have Dr. Priya Zar here, who is the head of the Complex Pain and Addiction Service, which is a consult service under the Department of Psychiatry at Vancouver Coastal Health, British Columbia, Canada. And it provides management of pain mental health disorders, and substance use disorders across all clinical services at Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, she's also the director of the Translational Research Program for Psychiatry, Addiction, and Pain, as well as the director for the DGH and UBC Pain Curve Disorders Fellowship. We also have Dr. Nick Matthew. He's a medical director of the Complex Mental Health and Substance Use Services at the BC MHS US Health Authority. And we have Dr. Martha Ignacevsky, who is the educational lead of CPAS, as well as the clinical lead of the substance use um, response and facilitation service at BC Children's Hospital. And she's also the senior medical director of substance use and concurrent disorders at BC Children's. Okay, so a couple of professional and financial disclosures. So Dr. Azar was a consultant on endivier led buprenorphine extended release studies, and Dr. Ignacevsky has given educational talks for endivier. Dr. Azar has a patent uh, on a technology that allows one to detect and quantify um, analytes, such as opioids. And Dr. Azar's and Ignacevsky's research funding is supported by the BCH Research Institute, the BGH and UBC Hospital Foundation, as well as UBC. So I want to acknowledge that our research would not have been possible without um, our Soma Gannison Translational Research for Psychiatry and Down Fund. I um, also want to acknowledge that we have a concurrent disorders fellowship, um, currently supporting two fellows. Um, they unfortunately could not be here, but they've been instrumental in our research. Um, all other presenters do not have financial or other relationships with the manufacturers of the products discussed in this workshop. Okay, so learning objectives. So first, it is to describe how sublingual buprenorphine naloxone low-dose inductions can be used in inpatient and outpatient settings. Second is to describe how buprenorphine naloxone low-dose inductions can be used in the chronic pain prescription, opioid tolerant setting, and in other various populations such as geriatric patients, youth, and adolescents. And third is to describe how transdermal buprenorphine can be used to rapidly initiate patients onto buprenorphine naloxone and buprenorphine extended release. So I want to kick us off by presenting a video of a patient who has gone through our program and protocols. Um, the reason why I originally came to VGH was um, an injury I received at a shopping center in the downtown east side. Um, I was pushed down a flight of 53 stairs from a security guard. Um, I was using in a, a public washroom, ended up falling asleep in the stall where I was using in the washroom. The mall ended up closing. The security guard, there was two of them, the security guards were doing their rounds to clear the mall before they closed the doors and leave for the night. And they found me in the washroom and told me I needed to get out of there and so I did reason why I was there in the first place was because it was pouring rain outside and I was just trying to get somewhere to get a little bit get out of the rain stay dry for a little bit right and um, as they're escorting me out we were exchanging comments they're they're belittling me they're making fun of me I was having none of it so I was returning the comments in return and um, I was three steps from the top of a th series of three flights of stairs. And um, I said something to him that pushed him over the edge and he, he shoved me from behind and I went flying down the remainder of the flights of stairs, ended up landing on the floor, breaking my biggest bone in my body and my left leg, my femur, and um, screaming in agony, they ended up one security guard picked me up from my right side, the other picked me up from my left side, and they dragged me out the remainder of the mall. It's pouring rain outside, remember? And they threw me out onto the pavement, 
in the pouring rain, threw my bag beside me, and then locked the door. Oh. And so, uh, yeah, it's hard to talk about even still. Sure. So you share these patient videos because you think it's very important to hear and learn from patient perspectives. Um, to keep in mind of the people that we're serving and the potential life-saving impact that research can have. So we'll circle back towards the end of this video, um, towards the end of the presentation. So I want to go through a couple of slides to talk about the epidemiology, um, the crisis, particularly in British Columbia, um, which is the province that we're from. So BC, um, British Columbia, is widely considered to be the epicenter of the crisis in Canada. We have the highest overdose death rate um, out of all the provinces and territories in Canada, um, as well as having a death rate um, much higher than most states in the US. So this is a figure that shows um, unregulated drug overdose deaths and the death rate uh, in BC. And we can see in the late 90s to the 2000s, we had roughly about 100 to 200 deaths per year. But now we're seeing 100 to 200 deaths per month uh, in the current situation. So last year in 2022, we've had over 2,200 deaths in, in BC. So this is a very striking statistic that shows the loss of life um, that's uh, stemmed from the overdose crisis in BC. Uh, overdose deaths are the leading cause of death in British Columbia for persons aged 10 to 59, more than homicides, suicides, accidents, and natural disease combined. So there have been roughly six deaths per day uh, in, in BC from overdoses. So primary reason uh, why we have so many overdose deaths is the prevalence of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in our province. So if we're looking at about 10 years ago, we had about you know, 4 to 30 percent um, of deaths that have fentanyl detected, and now we have roughly 80 to 90 percent. So this is showing the potency of fentanyl and carfentanyl uh, for opioid naive individuals. So you can see that a fatal dose of fentanyl is much um, lower than that of heroin, as fentanyl is about 100 times more potent than morphine and about 50 times more potent than heroin. We've also been, we also have been seeing carfentanyl appear in the drug market. Um, so carfentanyl is a fentanyl analog. Intended use is really for tranquilizing large um, mammals like elephants, but it also has become really prevalent in the drug market. And really what this means is that a lot of our patients coming into our service um, have developed very high opioid tolerances for the use of fentanyl and, and other fentanyl analogs. So this is um, a slide showing the medical medication-assisted treatment options we have for OUD in Canada. We have buprenorphine naloxone, it's a partial agonist. We have methadone. Um, we also have 24 extended release or morphine or cadian, and we also have IOT options um, in the form of morphine and hydromorphone. And we also have extended release fetal buprenorphine. And we'll be mainly focusing on uh, buprenorphine naloxone and extended release fetal buprenorphine for our talk. So I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Azar, who's going to talk a bit more about the pharmacology of buprenorphine. Um, I, you know, I'm sure this will be review for most of the people here, but um, all of our protocols are involving uh, the use of buprenorphine. So I thought it would be interesting to review the pharmacology just briefly and to relate how we developed our protocols to the pharmacology of buprenorphine and particularly the pharmacokinetics. So um, as James mentioned, buprenorphine, the sublingual uh, formulation is available as suboxone in our uh, province. So combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. So buprenorphine semi-synthetic opioid, high affinity for mu receptors, um, and uh, it's a partial agonist with regards to the mu receptors as well. Um, 
and slow dissociation from the new receptor. So I mean, in many ways, it, it makes for a great opiate agonist therapy option. Because it's a partial agonist, it's also partial with regards to many of the side effects, particularly respiratory dry. So now we're taught that buprenorphine has that threshold level in terms of uh, decreased respiratory uh, drive, and you cannot overdose with buprenorphine alone. Um, for our purposes, for opioid tolerant patients who have opioid use disorder, that's absolutely true. In our program, we often use buprenorphine um, for pain, and in that context, you certainly can overdose patients with buprenorphine alone. So just, just to keep in mind, everything's on a spectrum in medicine. So yeah, for our patients who use fentanyl who are opioid tolerant, yeah, there's that threshold level. Um, in pain context, the frail elderly patient that we're rotating off of a full agonist onto buprenorphine for pain, you can get into trouble with two milligrams of buprenorphine. Just a little bit more about the pharmacology, and not to go through all the details, but a couple of points that I think are important to consider, and we're gonna sort of circle back to this once we talk about how our protocols have evolved. Um, one is that the maximum plasma uh, concentrations of buprenorphine occur between 40 minutes to three and a half hours after um, initiation of sublingual buprenorphine, and that the duration of action for buprenorphine is dose dependent, meaning that you need about eight to 12 milligrams of buprenorphine to get 24 hours of action. And you'll see why this is important when we talk about how we develop our protocols. Uh, just, just a quick note that um, in the past, low dose inductions were called micro inductions. Um, and over the past couple years, um, that, that's fallen out of favor for a number of reasons. So now we're calling them low dose inductions. In fact, right now it's impossible to publish something that's called microinductions when it comes to buprenorphine inductions. The other point is that many of the protocols we're going to show today um, may not be feasible in your location. So there are different regulations in terms of which medications we can use in what context in Canada and British Columbia. So you may see protocols and think to yourself, well, we can't do this where we practice. And yeah, th that may be true, but we're just trying to demonstrate that what is possible and pharmacologically possible um, in our context. Okay, so just to be a little bit um, interactive, what is the buprenorphine induction challenge? What makes starting somebody on buprenorphine a little bit difficult sometimes? Yeah, so precipitated withdrawal. And they need to wait for somebody to go into withdrawal to be able to induce someone to buprenorphine, right? Um, who can tell me what the mechanism of precipitated withdrawal is? Okay, keep, so keep going with that. Like it acts as an Okay, okay, so, um, yeah, and does somebody want to elaborate on what, what, what's that? Go ahead. What do you mean, you mean without buprenorphine? Like, in the context? Buprenorphine, how, how does buprenorphine cause precipitated withdrawal? That's usually how, and you're both, you're both sort of um, have described what's commonly um, thought of as the mechanism, right? So you have a molecule that has a higher affinity for the receptors, but less agonist activity. So it would then bind to the receptor and outcompete the full agonist, but not provide enough opioid effect. Is, is that what you're saying, essentially? Okay, so let's just go through this and, and let's see if we can make sense of it. <clears throat> so I've just created a, a graph just to illustrate this point. So y-axis, we have opioid agonist effect. Um, X-axis, we have time. So let's just say this person uses about 20,000 micrograms of fentanyl for 24 hours. It's reasonable, a little bit on the low side, but this is what we see. So let's just say we immediately introduce 16 milligrams of buprenorphine. So expectation is what's gonna happen. And the person is not in withdrawal. They've just used. We're going to precipitate withdrawal, okay? Because they're going to be on an opiate deficit. Now let's just say we microinduce them or low dose induce them over 48 hours, and then give them 16 milligrams of buprenorphine. Now it could be 32 milligrams; doesn't really matter. We're just demonstrating the point. So at this point, 16 milligrams will be enough to meet their opiate requirements. 
right? Because we're maintaining them now on 16 milligrams of just So we have the same molecule under the same physiological conditions now able to meet their opiate requirements. So we've got to reconcile this, this concept. What's happened over these 48 hours where previously we we're saying that 16 milligrams is going to put somebody into withdrawal because they're going to be an opiate deficit, but now it's adequate to meet their opiate requirements. Any thoughts? Yep. Okay. Okay. It's tapering the full agonist, okay. But it's still the same dose of buprenorphine, right? So something has to change in this system. Whether you replace it rapidly or gradually, there's something in the system has to change for it to not cause withdrawal. No? Ah, that's a good point. Many people describe that. So they say, okay, 48 hours has gone by. The full agonist has been metabolized. Um, their tolerance is changing. But we're hitting these guys hard with the full agonist during these 48 hours. I mean, we're giving them IV push fentanyl sometimes, and you'll see the protocols we use. So we're not changing their tolerance. So to... Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens when you're exposed to high potency opioids that are highly lipophilic, have high receptor affinity, high intrinsic activity, you have receptor level changes that occur, right? Internalization, desensitization, G protein decoupling, et cetera. So the thought is that there are certain molecules, antagonists and partial agonists, that may reverse that process rapidly. Because what happens when you're opioid tolerant? You actually, it seems counterintuitive, but you're actually at, at a receptor deficit, right? So suddenly you have more receptors available that are more sensitive, which puts you at a rapid uh, opioid deficit. So that's what's changing in the system. It's, it's, it's the configuration and availability of receptors. Any questions around that? We did write a paper with a group um, uh, out of the US just kind of describing this model. OK, so precipitated withdrawal. Here's a video that describes somebody's experience with precipitated withdrawal. It's the worst feeling in the world. It's, oh my God, it's like, it's like somebody gave you 20 hits ass and kicked you in the nuts as hard as they could and then told you to walk it off. You know, your body, everything aches. Every muscle, every hair, you feel pain in every muscle in your body, every hair, every joint, every, your fingernails are even feeling pain, you know? And then you get the runs, the burning, burning runs like I got now, and they're horrible. It's, and it's just inflamed. And you keep thinking, okay, if I take a little of this, it'll make it better. Nothing can make it better, nothing. You just gotta, you know, you gotta sweat it out for that 24 hours, 48 hours, however long it's gonna be. And the thoughts I was having, like, uh, you know, I was seeing aliens running around the room and stuff like that. You hallucinate. And it smelled, you know, I could smell my dead wife's perfume. Hmm. Like, she was right in the room with me, you know, and just, it was horrible. Precipitous withdrawal was horrible. Hmm. And it's the most curious thing on the planet. So, terrible experience, right? And this is, this is the clinical problem. That's what's, what we're trying to avoid with our protocols. So what are the current induction strategies? Well, it's the traditional induction strategies. As somebody mentioned, you wait for them to go into withdrawal. Many of our patients, at a certain point in their use, are using solely to avoid withdrawal. They're not partying anymore. So they will go through great lengths to avoid opioid withdrawal to the point where they will do what it takes to uh, obtain fentanyl um, before caring for themselves and their loved ones. So to tell somebody we have this amazing treatment, but you have to go into withdrawal to get it, it can be a difficult thing for them to um, accept. There was a couple of papers around in, in, inducing withdrawal with naloxone and rescuing with buprenorphine, but in my mind, that's we're not going to discuss it. I mean, that's not a real clinically viable uh, approach. Um, so Bernie's method, that was the very first um, description of a low-dose induction um, protocol um, developed by Dr. Robert Hannon. Um, many of our protocols have come, all of our protocols, are based on the Bernese method. So we have the 48-hour rapid low-dose induction protocol. Um, then there's a 48-hour 
rapid low dose induction onto extended release buprenorphine. So we'll discuss that one as well. And then we have the 48 hour transdermal buprenorphine induction protocol. Um, it's our newest protocol and it's really our standard of care at this point. And then we'll briefly also talk about high dose inductions or macro dosing, which is um, getting a lot of attention these days as well. So um, it's just interesting how our protocols have evolved. Um, the very first approach we had to get around the problem of um, precipitate withdrawal was uh, the, what we were calling like the fentanyl bridge. Essentially, we would put somebody on a fentanyl patch, wait for the previous opiate to wash out. This is really before the age of um, unregulated fentanyl, and then transition them onto buprenorphine without withdrawal. It worked actually nicely because the K values that were somewhat similar between uh, fentanyl and buprenorphine. So this is Christian Schutz. I don't know how, how many of you may know him. Um, he, he's originally from Germany, well-known um, researcher, psychiatrist as well, addiction psychiatrist. So I reached out to Christian and I was like, look, we got, we're doing this new protocol. We're calling the um, fentanyl bridge protocol. He was like, it's interesting. I haven't heard of it before, but do you know about microdosing? So he was like, this is a new protocol that my colleagues out of Switzerland are doing. They're calling it the Bernese method. Their English paper is coming out soon and they're starting at low doses and gradually tapering up. So this was very interesting for us. And we kind of went with this protocol because it made a lot of sense. This is Robert Hamming. So super humble guy, I've never met him before. But um, you know, I sometimes wonder if he, if he really appreciates the impact of um, his uh, ingenuity and, and use of pharmacology to create a protocol. So this was our first um, protocol that we use in our hospital. Uh, this was our order set, and it was based on the Bernese method. And the Bernese method, usually, you know, they, would, they, they would often induce people over many days to weeks. We reduced it to about seven days. Um, and, um, and then our protocols evolve from here forward, sort of using the pharmacokinetics of buprenorphine. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Ekinshevsky to go through our first case. Okay, so we're gonna use a case to uh, talk through the development of uh, uh, some of the clinical protocols uh, and to think about some of the uh, decision-making that went into this. So I'll be talking about the case of CM, who was a 16-year-old female youth who, who was admitted to um, BC Children's Hospital uh, after an uh, opioid overdose. Uh, she'd been using with her partner uh, in the community, and uh, that's when she had the overdose. Her partner administered CPR, and when um, emergency services were summoned, she had a Glasgow uh, scale of three was resuscitated with naloxone and uh, subsequently brought to hospital. Uh, in hospital, her urine drug screen was positive for fentanyl, opiates, as well as amphetamines. By history, this was a 16-year-old with a past medical history of untreated hepatitis C. Uh, she also carried diagnoses of severe opioid and severe stimulant use disorders, as well as untreated ADHD, and she um, had a, a challenging upbringing with lots of early life ad adversity, uh, lots of intergenerational trauma in the family, as well as uh, developmental trauma with an adverse ch uh, childhood experiences score greater than eight, and that resulted in a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, with respect to her social history, this is a youth that was in care of Child Protective Services, or in BC, this is called the Ministry of Child and Family Development, or MCFD. She was under a voluntary care agreement, uh, and the reason for that was relating to uh, complex dynamics between her and her parents and a very um, uh, strained relationship. So she was actually residing uh, at a, should have been residing at a group home uh, for high-risk youth. However, she spent much of her time uh, in the downtown east side, uh, which is um, uh, one of the areas where uh, substance use disorders, uh, individuals with uh, complex mental health issues and uh, homelessness, no fixed address and other um, uh, challenging social determinants of health and marginalization congregate in Vancouver. Uh, so this is where she spent a lot of her time, uh, where she procured substances as well. In, in spite of this uh, history, she was able to develop some attachments with a few key figures in her life. She continued to maintain a relationship with her mother despite the strain. 
Uh, she also had a caseworker who was an important figure in her life um, and had a positive relationship with the hospital, was able to view it as a safe space for ongoing care and treatment. Uh, with respect to her substance use, she reported the use of between half a gram uh, to one gram of intravenous fentanyl on a daily basis, and her last use had been a couple of hours prior to the admission in the context of the opioid overdose. And she'd actually had a number of recent overdoses, uh, at least five, all of which had required the use of uh, naloxone uh, for reversal. She was also using intravenous crystal methamphetamines on a daily basis. And in speaking with her about the, the drivers of her use, really the reason that she, that she initiated use, that she continued to use, she really spoke about the avoidance that, that substance use brought to her in terms of taking away the pain with respect to her symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And despite that, she was able to recognize that substance use had, had played a major, ch major challenging role in her life and expressed a goal of wanting to abstain from the use of fentanyl and other substances. Through a collaborative discussion uh, to determine uh, next steps in treatment and, and a plan for opioid agonist therapy or to select a medication for opioid use disorder, she selected um, buprenorphine naloxone. And this actually led to one of the uh, first innovative strategies trying to decrease the time frame for the induction for her, um, trying to avoid precipitated withdrawal. Uh, this would have been a barrier for this young person to um, uh, receive this treatment. That was uh, something that she was uh, uh, very forthcoming about. The experience of withdrawal was one of the major uh, reinforcers of her ongoing use, and so any ability to avoid that was important to her. So that, uh, that and the um, um, availability of um, hospital-based services uh, led to the uh, truncation of the seven-day protocol to a five-day outpatient protocol, uh, starting with low doses of uh, sublingual buprenorphine on day one, uh, half a milligram, which is about a quarter tablet. We don't have films, we just have the tablets. Um, on the second day, increasing it uh, to, uh, sorry, uh, receiving the same dose. On the third day, actually going up to a half a milligram, uh, the subsequent day up to two milligrams, and then on the fifth day, uh, receiving four milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine without any precipitated withdrawal. Uh, in order to improve um, uh, success with the induction, there were many efforts that were developed, including a series of collaborative partnerships between uh, the hospital staff, uh, really between the um, Adolescent Medicine Service with uh, uh, Dr. Azar, who was consulting from the adult hospital at this point in time uh, to develop the strategy. Uh, we developed partnerships with local pharmacies. Our, our federal regulations are different in Canada than they are in the US. So pharmacies, um, regular pharmacies, not opioid treatment programs, uh, administer um, and dispense most opioid agonist therapy. Um, and in order to retain her, there was an effort to uh, provide early carries for the buprenorphine uh, to have a home delivery and actually to bubble pack all of the medications to reduce the challenge of needing to remember what's daily dosing, uh, the increases in all of those pieces. Um, and contingency management principles were also utilized uh, to help um, uh, increase the chances of success here. And so she received some incentivization for picking up the medications on a regular basis. And there's also the use of outreach and telehealth uh, in order to best support this young person with this induction. Before you go on. So did the pharmacy split the medicine up for you on that five-day program? Yes. <clears throat> the pharmacy split up the medications, they bubble pack it, and then the individual comes to pick it up either on a daily basis. That wasn't the case here. We provided a five-day bubble pack. I see that says we <laughs> I think that there's some uh, there's some legislation attempting to be introduced in the U.S. to move in that direction, but this is this is what all of our pharmacies may have capacity to do. And so that was published uh, uh, the in, the successful induction of buprenorphine naloxone using a microdosing schedule as well as a sort of outreach. And I'm going to pause now uh, to see if there's any questions. Go ahead. Yeah. 
That's correct. Yeah, so she maintained her, she continued using her own unregulated substances, as in the background we used the low-dose induction with the buprenorphine. What's that representation? So in this case, there was there was small uh, gift cards that were provided, um, nominal amounts, but every day she would come to pick up the medication, adhere with the outreach. Uh, there were gift cards and other pieces like that that were used. Um, this was not funded through any program. This was actually out of the, the kindness of the hearts of the individuals that were working with this individual. That, that guy in the trucker hat you see over there. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so uh, the first presenter made comments about this may not be feasible based on what country you're in. So mm -hmm. I, I, I totally get the outpatient detox, so I was just confused. If, if this was in like a residential treatment center, uh, 3.5 residential, that would be a problem because she would still have to have some full uh, some full agonists administered. Absolutely. And, and that actually will bring us to some of the next protocols and how we actually have shifted because some of our practices have actually become looking to admit patients to higher levels of care to hospital, uh, specifically the consult service that we work in. And we'll go through some of that in a moment. I'll see if there's just one more question before we move on. So she, she's told on day six to stop fentanyl? That's right. Was she, she was able to do that? Well, go ahead. <laughs> So to follow up from the question, CM came back to the hospital eight days later. Um, so she was brought into the emergency department. Uh, she had a fentanyl overdose. She was malodorous. She was disheveled. Her urine drug screen was positive for fentanyl and methamphetamine. Uh, she was not able to complete the low dose induction as she had lost the bubble pack and she had ended up relapsing. When she came back into ho the hospital, her goal was to maintain abstinence and uh, to be on buprenorphine again. She was admitted with cellulitis, and we had one to three days uh, to induce her onto Suboxone. So we have this protocol that ended up getting published. It was a good protocol, but it didn't fit the needs of the patient that was in front of us. And sometimes if our protocols don't fit the needs of the patients, sometimes we need to fit the protocols to the needs of the patient. And so that's how we came up with the next protocol. So um, as, as Martha mentioned, the original Bernie's method was, you know, it could have been 14 days up to seven days. We found it that the 0 0.25 milligrams wouldn't induce people, but also 0 0.5 wouldn't induce people as well. So we just skipped the first two days and we started on 0 0.5 uh, for, for Suboxone. But then going back to the pharmacology, it didn't quite make sense. Because if you look at the peak plasma concentration for buprenorphine, it is 40 minutes to three and a half hours. And then for the doses to stack and have a 24 hour effect, you have to be at eight to 12 milligrams. So what if we didn't dose people once or twice a day, but we shortened the interval between the doses? And that's how we came up with our 48 hour protocol. So we used the higher end of the peak serum level, three hours, and we started with 0 0.5, and we started giving people 0 0.5 milligrams eight times a day, so every three hours. And then the next day, we shifted that up to one milligram every three hours. And then on the third day, we could start them on 16, 24 milligrams of, of Suboxone. So, uh, the slides will be available, you guys can have them. Um, going back to the idea of uh, precipitated withdrawal, if we had given this person 16 milligrams right away, we would have induced the receptor level changes that would have caused precipitated withdrawal. However, if we give small doses every three hours over 48 hours, we can get them up to 16 milligrams. And it is the receptor level changes because during this whole time, we are providing full agonists. So we are giving, high, mostly we use hydromorphone, but you can also give um, oxycodone or morphine as well. And 
So it isn't that there's um, a partial agonist that comes in and shifts um, the balance and that's what causes precipitated withdrawal. It's uh, preventing the receptor level changes from occurring. And so if we give small doses over 48 hours, even if we're providing full agonists at the same time, we will not precipitate withdrawal. We're able to induce people onto suboxone and they're able to do this without going into any sort of withdrawal. So happy to take some questions. Sure. The answer is yes. So we'll go through some of our protocols a little bit later that use buprenorphine without naloxone. <coughs> yeah. The pain ones? So I'm having a hard time following the logic here. Because sure. Number nothing figures. Two, you're using that example. But you were modifying the protocol based on an end of one. Yeah, I mean, so this was, uh, this was an end of one, right? So this was CM. So once again, um, th this patient came in and we had three days to induce her onto Suboxone. The only protocols that existed in the world at that time were the five and seven day protocols, which wasn't enough. So we had to try to do something different because we only had a certain amount of time to try to get this person onto Suboxone. So it was an N of one, but then it's been repeated and we we're actually doing a randomized control trial right now. And we have a lot of patients uh, that have gone through it. In fact, this is the standard for inductions. Nobody does uh, the classical induction where we wait, people, wait for people to go into withdrawal. We, we start the microdosing right away. Go ahead. Yes, uh, there is. And uh, we got another protocol that helps solve that problem. So um, each of the protocols that we're showing is stepwise, and it shows when you look at the last protocol, it really is the buildup of everything that we've done before. So, go ahead. Last one. So, uh, two two part question. Sure. That patient that went to the hospital for three days. She was still given opiates for the cellulitis. Yes. Yeah. And and the last part of the question: Have you been successful in doing uh, the microdosing uh, outpatient for? The yeah, I mean, the, the pharmacy still has to do the, the bubble pack, but yeah, the, I mean, the, there's there's like published case reports on people doing rapid microdosing on an outpatient basis, so it, it's certainly possible. It's just, um, it, it's difficult for patients, and that's why we evolved our protocols. Um, I'll hand it to Dr. Azo. Um, you know, the, the, this, this I think it's an important question. This, uh, like, was this an N of one, and how did you consent the patient? You know, like I think part of our approach is we have clinical dilemmas and problems in front of us, and we're you know trying to solve them using pharmacological rationale. Sometimes we do things off label, but we certainly describe to our patients that you know this is off label. These are the different options. For our studies, we do have ethics approval, so uh, we go through a rigorous ethics process for our CTs, etc. Um, okay. So the patient um, came back to hospital, and well, okay. So I'll go through the clinical problem first. Um, essentially, the next problem that that we wanted to solve was the concept of needing to wait seven days while the patient stable on sublingual buprenorphine before administering extended release buprenorphine. So according to the product monograph, you have to induce an individual onto sublingual buprenorphine, stabilize them, minimum seven days, then start extended release buprenorphine. So the problem was the patient actually was, <laughs> excuse me, was admitted three days after she was discharged. So once again, with an overdose. So although we were able to get her onto buprenorphine in hospital at a treatment dose, she was not able to continue uh, once she was discharged. Um, she ended up using with her boyfriend again. She was using intravenous fentanyl, 
um, and she overdosed. It just speaks to how chaotic her experience was, um, that even though she was on a treatment dose, she just wasn't able to take the tablet every day. So now this individual has had multiple overdoses, and <laughs> eventually, <coughs> excuse me, um, she would, um, the expectation is that she's gonna pass away like many of our patients do. So what we really needed was a strategy to get her onto the deeper preparation of buprenorphine and rapidly before she's discharged back to the streets again. So we did not have the seven days required to stabilize her onto buprenorphine. And when you think about the pharmacology and the serum levels that are expected to, to be achieved prior to starting somebody on the extended release buprenorphine, there was no pharmacological rationale that dictated why the individual has to be on buprenorphine for seven days. And when I speak to Indivia, really that's just how the studies were done, um, not based on any specific rationale around safety. <coughs> so what we ended up doing is we essentially reinduced her onto buprenorphine using our 40 hour, 48 hour protocol and went directly onto the extended release uh, formulation. So within 48 hours, we had her on to supplicate or extended release buprenorphine. <coughs> and this was a paper, I believe this is the first paper that demonstrates rapid induction of um, extended release buprenorphine. And now in our province, this is a standard. And um, there's no expectation that you have to wait seven days to get somebody on to extended release buprenorphine. Uh, most of our patients are rapid marker induced, low dose induced onto buprenorphine and then provided the injection. So somebody um, asked a very important question, which was um, how successful is this in an outpatient setting? Right? So we have this protocol that's extremely robust. Um, our, our, our CT is actually, you know, we have some pro problems with it now because it's low dose induction versus standard of care. And almost 100% of the people in standard of care drop out and want the low dose induction because once they start to go into withdrawal, they no longer want to proceed down that arm. So from our experience so far, it's vastly superior. But because it's dosed every three hours, um, it's, not a very pr it's a very onerous protocol in hospital, and it's not a very practical protocol in an outpatient setting. And so the expectation is <laughs> for 48 hours, the patient has to dose themselves every three hours. So the thought was, is there another way of administering buprenorphine that, that doesn't require the Q3H dosing? Now, we know that there's a transdermal product available, so the thought was, can we use the transdermal product to mimic our sublingual uh, protocol? So what we did was, we modeled, uh, we, we asked our, um, our PK expert that we were doing a lot of research with, um, Anil Maharaj, professor at UBC, to model the expected serum levels for our sublingual dosing, and how to mimic that using a transdermal induction protocol. So it turns out that the transdermal um, product in British Columbia is available in five microgram per hour, 10 microgram per hour, and 20 microgram per hour um, patches. So it turns out you can do that. You can actually mimic the serum levels with the transdermal product. So as you can see, so here each bump is one sublingual administration of 0.5 milligrams of buprenorphine every three hours and then you go up to one milligram every three hours. And here you have adequate serum levels to then provide the patient a treatment dose of buprenorphine, sublingual. And the dotted line is our serum levels that you achieve with the patches. So we're essentially mimicking very closely the serum levels using the patches. So what we do is we administer six um, 20 microgram patches at time zero. Time 24 hours, we add six more at time 48 hours, the patches come off and the patient gets a full dose of buprenorphine um, and they're induced. We do both inpatient and outpatient, but it's a beautiful outpatient protocol because it doesn't require frequent dosing. So this is the protocol that we use. Um, so essentially, as you can see, um, uh, the patches go on. Time zero, you get six 20 microgram patches are administered. Time 48 hours, six more are administered. So now you have 12 patches. 
And then at time 48 hours, the patches come off and you get the full dose of buprenorphine. Any questions around that? How do we how do we choose twenty micrograms? Just just the modeling. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. So it's, it's whatever we think that patient, if they're very heavy, if they use very heavily, I would give 60 milligrams all at once. If it's much less, you can start with eight milligrams and give as needed sublingual buprenorphine and consolidate after 24 hours or so. Yep. And that's what it looks like. So that's the 12 patches. And that's the paper that we publish on that protocol. So in our hospital, that's essentially the standard of care right now for buprenorphine inductions. Okay. So then the question was, all right, so we can go use this protocol to get onto sublingual buprenorphine, but there's nothing to say that we can't go directly to the, um, we can't then give them the, the deeper preparation injection. So what we ended up doing was going from the patches to sublingual to the depo injection. But then the question was, do we even need the sublingual at all? If we've achieved adequate serum levels using the patches, why can't we go directly to the depo? So that's what we're doing now. So essentially, our patients are no longer, if they want deeper preparation buprenorphine, they no longer get any sublingual. We just put on the patches patches come off and they get the depot and they're done. And that, that's the case report for that protocol. And so for the 48 hours, they remain on full agonist? Yeah. So yeah. You, and that's something you're prescribing? Yeah, that's right. So in so hospital- On like the first example where you tell the patient to continue the fentanyl, now it's evolved to where you're, in addition to giving the patches, you're also giving a full agonist prescription for In hospital, we've always given full agonists to meet their opioid requirements, right? Because again, the ex expectation is that they're gonna go into opioid withdrawal because we're not meeting their opioid requirements, right? In an outpatient setting, it's very analogous to starting somebody on methadone. If you start on 30 or 40 milligrams, you know it's not gonna be enough. And you know that patient's gonna continue using unregulated fentanyl until their dose is titrated up to the point where you're meeting their opioid requirements. During that time, they are gonna use. For methadone, that can take weeks to get up to an adequate dose. Here we're talking about 48 hours. So the criticism is always like, well, okay, this is great, but your patients are continuing to use during that time. And that's right, they are, and it's not great. But if you think about the alternative, I mean, this is nothing new. We've done this with methadone for decades. But now it's only 48 hours. And in fact, our newest protocol is 24 hours, which is pending publication. What's the depot dose at the end there? 300, yeah. And then, um, are you gonna, is the story evolving? That's right. Okay. So, great. Because <laughs> that's what I just want to know how this translates into yeah. what most of us do with that is your Well, a patient, it would be exactly the same. If you're able to access the patches, right? right um, yeah. We can. They're, in our hospital, it's covered. In some of our outpatient clinics, it's covered. But it is expensive um, if it's not covered. So the cost is an issue. And, and um, my expectation is once there's enough evidence, it'll be covered. So someone is sticking all 12 of these on well, they might come in. Yeah. Well, let's, let me move on, and, and then, yeah. and then, yeah, yeah. And then the other, the other interesting concept is we've kind of extended the computer modeling, and it turns out that you have adequate serum levels for about a, for the duration of the time that the patches are good. So you're maintaining serum levels for seven days that are adequate to induce them at any time during this time period. So once the patches go on the patient can come back within one to se two to seven days to be induced onto buprenorphine as long as the patches stay. Because now you're, you're delivering adequate buprenorphine through a transdermal route to protect them from overdose and meet their opioid requirements. So essentially, I mean, in theory, you could just maintain them on the patches if they don't want the injection or sublingual. And it's just a theoretical thing. We don't do that. Um, but pharmacologically speaking, they're getting adequate doses of buprenorphine based on the serum levels that are achieved with these doses. So to your question in an outpatient setting, you could put on the first six patches, 
they can take six patches home with them. Right? We're not worried about diversion of buprenorphine patches. Say, tomorrow around this time, put on six more patches, come back in a week, and you induce them. And during that time, they're taking a full active. So after about 48 hours, the opioid requirements are now close to being met with the patches alone. So you tell them, whatever you pres so you're prescribing the opiate agonist for two days, full agonist, and you tell them stop it and come back within seven? I rarely prescribe full agonist to take home. Um, in this setting, sometimes we do, but in, in, under most circumstances, it's again, it's analogous to the methadone concept where we're not going to meet your opioid requirements in the first couple of days. You will likely need to continue to use. In hospital, we're meeting their opioid requirements with what we're prescribing. Yeah. Maybe everybody had a traditional opioid rule. Lots of drugs are being used. Maybe sometimes. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so oftentimes we'll prescribe some as needed or PRN sublingual so that they can top themselves up um, um, to meet their opioid requirements. And we have some strategies around that that are pending publication and it's really I mean, other one kind of get lost in the weeds. But that's a good point. So as of now, they, they do get a dose of PRN or a script for PRN as needed sublingual buprenorphine after they get the shot to be able to top themselves up if they need to. How do you consider that as a model? Do you think you should let them know? Like, take what they're driving? Yeah, so that's the next step. Um, we do PK studies. I mean, for the, the protocol that we have ethics approval for right now to do in the outpatient setting is to collect blood and do PK sampling of unregulated fentanyl. Um, so we're, we're going down that road to get the actual serum levels. So um, we're completing a retrospective review of the cases. So we have about 100 cases in this retrospective review. Um, and so far, it's, it's, it's resoundingly positive. So you have no, no. Yeah. So we have an RCT going that's testing low dose inductions, it's, it's in process. You don't look pleased, but <laughs> that's okay. We'll move on. All right. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? You could, in theory, maintain people with the patches. You can move on to sublingual, or you could do the depot. This is, this is an interesting account of a patient. Um, this is a, a, a young man who was admitted with another fentanyl overdose. Um, he was there with his dad in hospital, and um, his dad was like, you know, we paid $40,000 to get him to a private treatment center to get onto buprenorphine. He went into withdrawal, and he left, and we had to rent out our home to support my son. Um, they were desperate. So we talked about different approaches, and um, we talked about um, this being one of the approaches. And he was interested to try it, and this was his feedback. He said, your method of getting me off of illicit opiates has been working absolutely perfectly. My dad is my best friend so I don't hide things from him. So being under your care and getting the most amazing treatment not only is a huge relief for me, but also for my dad and my mom, so my whole family thanks you. While I was admitted to BGH, over the course of days, you got me to a point that I've been wanting to get for years. Your method of getting people off of opioids is pretty much a miracle. My daily stress level has already plummeted, knowing that I don't have to constantly worry about getting my next lump of drugs. People who are in the situation I was need to know that it's possible to get off of fentanyl without having to go through horrible withdrawal. People need to know how you've perfected that procedure. Okay, so we can talk briefly about high dose inductions and macro dosing, but any more questions around those protocols? No? Okay. So what, what do you guys know about high dose inductions? Macrodosing. A rescue, what do you mean? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean um, yeah, so in, in many in, in many ways that's what it is, but not exactly. And we'll talk about a, a recent study. Um, 
So incidents of precipitous withdrawal during uh, multi-site emergency department initiated buprenorphine clinical trial. So essentially, this was a study. It was an observational cohort study using data from an ongoing clinical trial. So the patients had to be in moderate to severe, or they, might, they had to have had moderate to severe opioid use disorder. Um, the urine must be positive for opioids and negative for methadone. So their cow score had to be four or higher. So patients with cow score of eight or higher received eight milligrams of sublingual, buprenorphine in the emergency department, and were discharged with prescription for 16. So they were in withdrawal that their cows was eight or higher. So if their cows was four to seven, they received instructions on how to start buprenorphine at home once they went into withdrawal. So 1,200 patients were enrolled and there were only nine cases of precipitated withdrawal. So this is interesting. So what this points to, and this is actually something that we've done in our hospital for many years now, that if somebody is in withdrawal already, you can start them on a treatment dose of buprenorphine. We used to call this treatment dose inductions. So if they're in withdrawal, you don't have to uh, microdose them. You don't have to start at low doses. You can just give them a treatment dose of buprenorphine and, and they'll be able to tolerate it. You're essentially, like you said, rescuing them with buprenorphine. If they're not in withdrawal and you do it, they'll go into uh, precipitated withdrawal. Can I ask you a little bit question? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. I've seen this study. Yeah. And this doesn't square with what you think I'm saying. So this is saying less than 1% of people get precipitated withdrawal. How come it's not less than 1%? It's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's unusual, you know, Andrew Herring is, is a friend of mine. Um, it's unusual, it's, 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 and they, they actually describe this in, in the study themselves that is vastly different from anything else that's been published. Um, so we'll see how this rolls out. Certainly, like in this, patients do have to be in withdrawal, so they're waiting for patients to be in withdrawal. Most precipitate withdrawal happens when patients are not in withdrawal and they're given this dose. So that may account for that. The, could it be like a nomenclature thing where maybe precipitate long withdrawal or worse than withdrawal? Um, I think they, they use the definition of five or more points oh, escalation okay. on the cow score. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a standard definition of precipitate opioid withdrawal. Having said that, if somebody is already in withdrawal, I have no problem giving them 16 milligrams of buprenorphine as an induction dose. I mean, what are we afraid of? So pros and cons, high dose inductions, it requires the patient to be in withdrawal. So many of my patients are not in withdrawal. They were just used before they come in or they, they come in, they're uncomfortable, they want a full agonist to get out of withdrawal. So withdrawal is a barrier. But if they are in withdrawal, it's an immediate induction. So you don't have that 48 hours or 24 hours that you're describing where they will have to continue to use. They're immediately on to buprenorphine, which is great. So therefore, no full agonist overlap is required. Low dose induction is amazing because there's no withdrawal or minimal withdrawal, but there is 24 to 48 hour period of time where they will require full agonist overlap. Another benefit is that you can rotate from methadone or any full agonist onto buprenorphine using the low dose induction protocol. Okay. Um, do we have any questions around that before we move on? I know I've done a lot of talking. No? Okay. Just wanted to go through some of the papers that we've published. Um, so this low-dose induction says, turns, out, turns out to be a great protocol for pain patients. So we, we all may have patients who have been on prescri prescription opioids for pain for many years. They're opioid tolerant. Um, and then maybe they're experiencing some element of um, uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, this is a perfect protocol to get people off of uh, full agonists um, and to a partial agonist and maybe taper them off. So we use this often in the pain setting as well. This was interesting because uh, we also work um, in critical care, and um, there's an interesting clinical scenario where you have patients who are, are highly opioid tolerant, they have opioid use disorder, they're using many, many uh, micro, uh, milligrams of fentanyl, and now they're mechanically ventilated, maybe they're hit by a car, they had surgery, and when it comes, and they're on a hydromorphone infusion to meet their opioid requirements, and when it comes time to 
extubate them and wean the mechanical ventilation, when the full agonist infusions are stopped, they go into withdrawal and they become agitated and it becomes difficult to extubate them. So the thought was, is there a way to meet their opioid requirements using a molecule that doesn't reduce respiratory drive to the same extent as a full agonist? Um, so what we ended up doing is using low-dose inductions to meet their op opioid requirements with buprenorphine to wean the infusion, to be able to extubate them and then to taper them off of buprenorphine. So here we're using buprenorphine not as an opiate agonist therapy option, but just as a molecule to be able to meet their opiate requirements without significantly reducing their opiate drive. I'm gonna skip through these just for the interest of time. Okay, we're gonna to go to another video and then we'll move on. This is a patient's experience with low dose inductions in an outpatient setting. So you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hello. My name is Ryan, 20 years old, and I'm on the Suboxone program. Yeah, I started microdosing my uh, ICY here. Uh, I have no more cravings every day. Uh, that's every day consistently. As soon as I wake up, like, I don't have the cravings. Even if I didn't take the Suboxone, I've already had, I already had the Suboxone in my system. So, like, I wake up not wanting to use or frustrated about that at all. Yeah. So, it's working very well for me. I was using... Uh, I bought like a half ball and maybe gone in a day. Um, and then you started the suboxone microdosing, yeah. so small doses. And then you were still, I'm, I'm guessing you were still using it down sort of during the microdosing for some time? Uh, I used, uh, I think I used once or twice when I was doing the microdosing. Yeah. Because it was too small of a dose for yeah. me to even feel anything. Yeah. And plus my my buddy overdosed in front of me and that's the first time I've ever been on that, type, that side of the table. So okay. it's me the one overdosing. Yeah. So like for me seeing the eye legs brought out so much trauma and shit. So yeah. like yeah, I ended up using this a tiny bit and by like suboxone helps me not like overdose because it's the same stuff he overdosed on. So I like smoked the exact same thing but I didn't yeah. overdose. If I, I, have you had overdoses yourself? Yeah, I've overdosed four times on fentanyl and once on car fentanyl through cocaine, four times on heroin. Yeah, did you require yeah. Narcan? Uh, yes, multiple yeah. times. Even sometimes Narcan didn't even work. They had to bring me to the hospital. Okay, so do you have Narcan at home? Yeah, I always carry a Narcan on me now. What's Focus. your good good tone? What's your suboxone dose now? Uh, twelve milligrams. You having cravings on this dose? Uh, no, heck no. Suboxone actually really freaking helps with everything. Right. It's like I don't have to use. I don't have to worry about where I'm getting myself. I don't have to worry about going to a place to go use or a safe place to go use and all that. So like Suboxone has made my life a lot, a lot better now. Okay, so I do want to shift gears a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about withdrawal management in the age of fentanyl, um, unregulated fentanyl use. And I think this is important because this, this correlates directly to what we're doing with, with our buprenorphine induction protocols. Because there's been a lot of talk around the need to overlap with the full agonist. But um, what we're seeing in our hospital that is that patients' opioid tolerances are going up and up and up and up to the point where some of our patients uh, we're no longer able to meet their opioid requirements and get them out of withdrawal using hydromorphone alone. Even high, intravenous hydromorphone has not been adequate to get some of our patients out of withdrawal. So we needed a new protocol um, to treat withdrawal in hospital. So that's where um, this next uh, protocol, um, that's the context that we developed today. And we'll go through a quick case that demonstrates um, this withdrawal management protocol that we've developed. So this is a case of a, of a young woman. She's, she's a patient of mine that I've known for many years. Um, so, you know, she grew up in a very affluent part of town, um, really like the idyllic life, if you would think she was involved in gymnastics. These are all pictures of her that her and her mom provided to me with consent. Um, you know, she was in gymnastics and she had a beautiful home. She was very happy. And then during her adolescent years, um, she kind of got involved in the partying scene and she started using substances and things spiraled pretty quickly for her. She, she started using unregulated um, opioids. She got involved with an older partying crowd. And within two years, she ended up in our Vancouver's downtown east side, which is where our open drug scene is in Vancouver. So fast forward, now she's now 30 years old. She has severe opioid use disorder um, and stimulant use disorder. 
So she uses uh, about three and a half grams of unregulated fentanyl via IV route every day. In addition, she uses cocaine and methamphetamine. So um, in the past, she's used methadone. She's used, uh, she's tried 24 hour extended release morphine. She's used buprenorphine. She's also been tried on our injectable opioid agonist therapy program. So we have a limited program where patients can actually get in the community beyond intravenous diacetylmorphine or hydromorphone in, in hopes to, for them to avoid using unregulated fentanyl and that didn't work for her either. So very heavy use. She, she now carries the diagnosis of bipolar disorder and PTSD. And on admission, her urine was positive for fentanyl, opioids, cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, and benzodiazepines. So the reason she was in hospital is because she had chronic left ulnar wound. Um, this is the site of her IV use. And it was to the point where she was walking around um, with an open wound in her arm. She had osteomyelitis. She was septic. She'd been tri trialed um, in hospital on IV antibiotics many times. We would leave hospital to use because we had, a, we had a difficult time meeting her opiate requirements with hydromorphone. So the treatment plan essentially was we either keep her in hospital, treat with antibiotics, and give her surgery to reconstruct the arm, or she gets an above elbow amputation. So her goal was for us to meet her opioid and pain requirements, save her arm, and her long-term goal was abstinence on opioid agonist therapy, and hopefully enter an addiction treatment program. Our, our goals were to address her substance use, reduce her risk of reinfection, overdose death, and save her arm. So IV hydromorphone, we tried, it was not adequate to meet her opioid requirements. So we've developed an intravenous fentanyl program, that, a protocol that we use in hospital in these circumstances. Um, and essentially this protocol is providing patients IV push fentanyl, and we titrate it based on the pharmacokinetics of fentanyl. So we know that IV fentanyl takes about four minutes to get to the CNS. So we needed a way to titrate people on fentanyl to meet their opioid requirements, but to also stop titration based on objective signs. So we thought, to provide patients IV fentanyl every five minutes. So by five minutes, it would have entered the CNS, we would have seen the effects, and we can either introduce the next dose or not. And this titration would be inhibited based on a sedation scale and patient's subjective account. So this is a picture of one of our residents giving a large needle of IV fentanyl to a patient, which is IV push. And the top picture is just how much fentanyl may require to get somebody comfortable. So out of curiosity, does anybody have a sense of how much fentanyl is required to get some of these patients comfortable from a withdrawal perspective? Any thoughts? Four milligrams, yeah. Who said that? Yeah, okay, this is a, this is a good guess. Anybody else? So you're, you're actually right. So a couple of years ago, Four milligrams, so 4,000 mics, was, um, yeah, th that could get somebody comfortable. Sometimes less, sometimes 2,000 2, mics. Um, but four, four milligrams for 4,000 mics was pretty much the upper limit that we were seeing. Nowadays, we're seeing, you know, we just saw it creep up. So we saw it go up from like 2,000 to 4,000 to 8,000 to 10,000. The most I've seen is 16,000 mics of IV push fentanyl to keep somebody comfortable from withdrawal. So this is just a, a screenshot of our EMR. You can see this particular patient is requiring 8,000 mics of IV push fentanyl. You can see the day that she didn't get any was the day that she lost her IV access and then she ended up leaving hospital to use unregulated fentanyl. Once we were able to get her IV again, she remained in hospital and received our hospital fentanyl. So let's just talk a little bit about I know this, this seems unusual, but what this protocol is not and what it is. So what it's not, you know, we certainly don't use it on patients who don't use fentanyl, obviously. It's not meant as an opioid agonist therapy program, so we're not maintaining people on fentanyl. And it's certainly not our first line option. We will always use other opioids to meet the patient's opioid requirements before going to fentanyl. So what it is, 
it, it's a tool to keep patients in hospital, to meet their opiate requirements, to maintain their tolerance. So if they want to continue using unregulated fentanyl, when some of our patients say, listen, I'm gonna keep using fentanyl when I leave hospital, at least we, we will have maintained their tolerance and kept them in hospital to meet their medical needs. Sometimes our patients tell us, I, I do want to try methadone or buprenorphine. Then we'll use this protocol to get them out of withdrawal to keep them comfortable, and then we'll use whatever protocol is appropriate to get them onto their opioid agonist therapy. So this goes back to our low-dose induction protocols. We'll often, we will put patients onto this protocol to treat their withdrawal symptoms while we're low-dosing them in the background onto buprenorphine. And we've had patients, I mean, Martha's done this a bunch of times. Um, I think you were the first person in our group to do it, but we have treated patients with this protocol, low-dose induce them, and have them leave hospital on deeper preparation buprenorphine on supplicate. So you can imagine somebody severe enough that they require IV push fentanyl, but they leave on supplicate. Any questions? Yeah. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So um, that's fair. The induction. So this protocol is essentially done. I wasn't going to get into sort of all the details, but it's done in two stages. The first stage is the induction to see what their tolerance is, right? And that stage is done by the physician. So we're at the bedside. We're pushing every five minutes. It takes about half an hour usually to meet their opioid requirements. Once we have a maintenance dose, our maintenance dose is 50 to 100% of their total induction dose. And that's um, ordered Q1H PRN. Most patients get about Q3H. And that's then pushed by the nursing staff. Yeah, good question. Yeah, zero. So um, we are doing a retrospective review of this as well. Um, zero adverse events. So we initially started doing it in the ICU with lots of monitoring. And after we'd done a number and there were no adverse, I mean, you can imagine we're pushing fentanyl and it's really not touching these patients. And once they get a little bit sedated, at a certain point we stop, but um, the tolerances are so great that um, I've never seen a patient get overly sedated with this protocol. And we have a number of checks and balances in place to ensure safety and monitoring, et cetera. You're looking more and more <laughs> distressed <laughs> as, the, as the lecture's progressing. <laughs> Okay. Other questions? No. Okay. So I'll go th through the calculations we use to convert people to methadone from this protocol because this is something that we've done. Um, and um, it's interesting. So that same patient that I was describing, she ended up requiring 48,000 mics of fentanyl per 24 hours to keep her comfortable. And then once she, she was, we were able to keep her in hospital treat the sepsis, she had multiple surgeries, we were able to save her arm, and now it's getting close for her to be discharged from hospital. So already we've met the medical needs, which we had not been able to do previously under multiple admissions without this protocol. Okay, so now we're maintaining her on IV fentanyl, it's getting close for her to leave hospital, and her goal was to rotate to methadone. So we used the um, calculations to calculate what the equivalent methadone dose would have been and we got up to 480 milligrams, which is extremely high. Now you can imagine this is a patient who's had multiple overdoses in the past, um, has had severe medical sequelae of her substance use, um, and it, her goal has now shifted to abstinence on methadone. So we wanted to support this goal. We did a 20% dose reduction for incomplete tolerance, and we got to 380 milligrams as what a roughly equivalent dose of methadone would be for her which is interesting because it, it points to the fact that possibly we're using much lower doses of opiate agonist therapy than our patients require. So this is what it looked like. We did a cross titration. So again, she started at 48,000 mics of fentanyl per 24 hours, zero methadone. So what we did was we added one third of the methadone every three days, and we waited three days to allow methadone to get close to steady state before introducing the next dose. And then we reduced the 24 hour fentanyl dose by one ninth a day, so a third of a third a day. 
as you can see, over the course of a number of days, her, her fentanyl use went f with, from 48,000 mics for 24 hours to 4,000 mics for 24 hours. So massive reduction. And really, at this point, it was, this was um, more of a sort of a, this, this, this dose wasn't fully really driven by withdrawal symptoms. And her methadone dose stabilized at 390 milligrams. So and that's what re was required to keep her out of withdrawal and minimize cravings. Yeah, we had one bump of 775, but most of them were fine. And at 390, she was 391 milliseconds. That's scary. 391? But the 771. Yeah, so we, re we repeated it and, and we checked electrolytes, et cetera. Um, and it, it stayed less. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can find holes. But you can, you can see that at 390, her highest dose, she was at 391. Yeah. So I'm not advocating this as a standard of care by any means, but like this is what was required for this patient to come off of the fentanyl and stabilize. Now this is a very extreme case, um, and uh, I'm not by any means advocating that you guys obviously are not gonna go out and do this, but I'm just demonstrating that, I think there's a number of interesting points that are made here. One is how high patients' tolerances are at this point when they're using unregulated fentanyl, and possibly we're underdosing them with a full agonist because most of our full agonist, opioid agonist therapy doses that we use were developed not in a fentanyl using population. Yeah, I mean, this also might be an ancillary question in part to probably the challenges, but it's like, I saw another like study in Canada that showed that like subtlegate had like one, like basically method of comparing subtlegate, method had 40 times the amount of non fatal overdoses compared to subtlegate. So, I'm not aware of that particular study, are you guys? You know, it, it, it takes weeks to get people, to get somebody to a high, high enough dose of methadone where we're meeting their opioid requirements, right? During that period when they're using fentanyl, oftentimes they'll fall off of treatment. So you have patients that are co consistently restarting methadone. They're, they get up to 60 milligrams, et cetera, and then they're falling off of treatment. Yeah. I just, yeah. I don't know, this is my bias. This yeah. is my bias, but I'm mm -hmm. wondering, gosh, it's like, I'm wondering what the benefit though of them going methadone versus subalgate. And the only real benefit I can imagine is there's somebody who's just refusing to take subalgate. Yeah. For me, buprenorphine and subalgate is, is, is the first line if the patient is accepting of it, but some patients aren't. And some patients don't like the feeling of being on buprenorphine, right? So um, I, I always like to give buprenorphine and supplicate a kick if I can. If a patient doesn't want it, they don't want it. If they've tried it and they didn't like it, that you, ha you, you have multiple tools in your toolbox. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, it, yeah, I don't think it, I mean, it, there's a QTC warning for sublocate because it's a depot preparation opioid. Um, but the molecule in itself, obviously, it, it, it's the same. So I don't know how real that is as well. Um, we are working on, on an RCT, an outpatient RCT, um, looking at rapid methadone titration as well. I, I so. Yeah. 
it was primarily because it's a depot. Once it's in, it's difficult to get out. Yeah. That's right. Any other questions? Uh, we're at time. Yeah. Also 